Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Key to Systems Engineering Success. My name is Jacob Walters and I will be your host during today's webinar presented by Zane Scott. Zane Scott leads our professional services and training organization. For the past 25 years he has built a skill set which enables him to provide insight and guidance to individuals and companies as they improve organizational processes and methodologies across their organizations. He has also taught systems engineering methodology in the practical process context in a variety of settings. Zane brings a unique perspective to Vitek and its customers with a professional background in the litigation field. Zane is also a trained negotiator, labor management facilitator, and mediator. Before joining Vitek, Zane worked as a senior consultant and process analyst assisting government and industry clients in implementing and introducing organizational change into their companies. Before Zane gets started, I have just a few housekeeping items. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions in as soon as you think of them through the question tab on the webinar control panel. Zane will answer as many questions as he can today, but if we do not get to your question, we will reach out to you after the webinar. Um, the webinar is being recorded today. If you experience connection problems during a live presentation, a recording will be available within one business day. The uh, recording will be published to Vitek's webinar archive located on our website. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Zane. Zane, welcome. Good morning and uh, welcome everybody to this latest webinar in our Vitek series. We're happy that you've taken your time out to be with us and I hope that you'll find it uh, both entertaining and valuable. This morning we're going to talk about um, the key to systems engineering success in the context of uh, a set of challenges which are perhaps the, the most difficult ones presented to systems engineers. Systems engineers deal with difficult problems every day. I don't need to, to tell anybody here that. Uh, we face lots of constraints. Uh, time is always an issue. Money is an issue. Change is an issue as projects morph from one end to the other. And uh, a lot of factors combine to to make that the case. What we're going to talk about today is a way of dealing with those challenges by dealing with the, the fountain from which they spring. So we're going to take a look at systems engineering problems and their particular challenges. Beginning with the Enlightenment, we had a, a shift in mindset that went on. Um, in the medieval world, they viewed problems in a very holistic sense. They viewed the operation of the universe, for example, in a very holistic sense. And there was a good scoop of mystery level, leavened in. There were gaps in their information um, which, which they had to fill in with conjecture. But as they filled it in, they dealt with things in, in a very uh, systemic way. It's important that as we, as we look at the medieval worldview that passed out of favor and the advances that were made in the science, that we not confuse the improvement of information that came with the Enlightenment and later scientific developments with the value of their approach because their approach had many values and in many ways uh, we are finding that a return to some of the aspects of that approach are, are valuable for us today. If you take for example Ptolemy's view of the structure of the universe which was the widely accepted worldview in the medieval world, Earth was the center. The planets and heavenly bodies rotated around the earth uh, on spheres and these spheres moved and the planets moved with the spheres uh, and that's how they felt like what they saw going on in the sky was happening. 
the spheres moved in and out. In fact, you probably heard uh, the phrase, the music of the spheres. They were thought to generate a heavenly music as they uh, passed each other and, and rubbed together in the universe. And then along comes a fellow named Copernicus and, and later on a, a guy named Kepler and a telescope developer named Galileo and they begin to examine the path of the planets. And they came to the realization that uh, a couple of things were different than had been thought. First they came to the realization that the rotation of the planets that they saw was taking place not around the Earth but around the Sun. And it could be explained not using spheres but with equations. So they felt like there were laws, physical laws governing the, the rotation of the planets. This began to introduce a different mindset where the operation of the universe was controlled not so much by mystery but by laws. And the center uh, they thought of the universe at that time, now we, we recognize as the center of the solar system, was the sun and not the earth. And this caused some, some pretty frightening shifts in understanding. It brought on what is, what comes to be a, a pretty reductionist and mechanistic view of the world and they begin to speculate and look into other things and say, hey, do, do these things function according to laws as well? So you have people like William Harvey who was a, an English physician who looked at the operation of the circulatory system and identified the circulation of blood as happening according to uh, specific processes and, and be controlled by rules and laws that govern that. So the worldview began to shift in lots of areas of science away from the mysterious view and uh, began to be broken down into a new worldview. We moved from the, mis the mystery and the holistic view of the medieval world to the laws and a more reductionist view of the, uh, of the Renaissance and of the ultimately of the Enlightenment. This will all come to fruition in terms of understanding with physicists like uh, Newton and mathematicians and philosophers um, like Descartes as this worldview took over. And so we essentially adopted a machine view of the universe. In, the, in this mechanistic view, A would cause B and B caused C. And so just as if you know the diameters and locations of the centers and the number of teeth in these gears, you can tell by any the rotation of any one of the gears what the resulting positions of all the rest will be through a chain of, of cause and effect. Um, they felt like all of science uh, could be explained in that way and it was a matter of discovering the relationships and discovering the rules. Systems that uh, were composed of lots of moving parts, uh, what we would now call complicated systems, were best explained by breaking them down. And this is how, how we say that it became reductionistic. If you want to understand this machine, you break it down into its component parts and understand uh, the speeds at which these gears turn and, and the relationship between the diameters of the gears and the number of teeth and the, the rotations of the other gears. But you begin to understand it by breaking it down into its constituent parts and we begin to lose the more holistic view of the systems that we encountered. Now as we moved forward with our worldview and moved forward into the kinds of problems that we were willing to tackle and that we were able to tackle, we entered a world of complexity. And this is the world that, that we live in now. 
we have brought the enlightenment worldview into a world that doesn't just have complicated systems but has complex systems. Now in the world of, of complexity and the understanding of complexity science and thought about complexity, there's not a lot of rigor around the, the definition of complicated versus the definition of complexity. And those very often get used interchangeably. A good way to think about a, a difference there, and it's helpful to understand the difference, is that in a complex system, the behavior that emerges from the overall system is the result of emergence. In other words, it's not a linear deterministic cause and effect, but rather the, the characteristics and the behavior of the system emerge. Uh, the example that I like to use to think about the concept of emergence is that an atom of oxygen and an atom of hydrogen, neither, neither one are wet per se. Uh, if you put them together into a molecule with two hydrogens and one oxygen, which of course is a water molecule, that molecule is not wet either. But if you aggregate a bunch of water molecules together, of course you get water, which is wet and that property, the property of wetness, emerges as we consider a group of water molecules versus one or the constituent atoms that go into it. It's not an additive effect, it's not a linear effect, but emergence is different. So if you can take the system apart, like the machine that we just saw in the last slide, and analyze it and predict the results and, and the operation of the system in that linear fashion, you're dealing with a complicated system. But if the results of the system tend to emerge, you're dealing with a complex system. Now we can divide complexity um, into different slices on different planes. One of the uh, first divisions that we might make is the division between detail complexity and dynamic complexity. Detail complexity is the closest cousin to the complicated system. Lots of moving parts make a system complicated and lots of elements, lots of moving parts uh, in this instance can produce a detail complexity in a system. The other kind of complexity as opposed to detail complexity is dynamic complexity, which is the complexity of how the, the system operates and changes over time. So you, you can divide your complexity up into detail and dynamic complexity. Sometimes, and, and arguably very often, those concur but those are two different ways of thinking about complexity. Another slicing can be made between physical complexity and adaptive complexity. So you can have complex physical systems and complex adaptive systems. In a complex physical system you generally have a set of physical elements are arranged in a particular pattern and these elements over time through the operation of particular laws will move from one pattern to another, from one arrangement to another. In the world of complexity science we call those patterns of arrangement states and so a complex physical system changes state and you can explain the change as the operation of, of particular laws. For instance, uh, a chess game is an example of a complex physical system because the elements which are arranged on the chessboard, the pieces arranged on the chessboard, are moved according to a set of rules. It's not a deterministic move. So if you look at a position on the chessboard, you can't say 
that this state or this position of the chess pieces on the board is automatically going to become a particular arrangement of the pieces because the next move is going to be this. The next move is up to the player, but the next move is constrained by a set of rules. So while it's not deterministic, the system does change states according to the operation of a set of rules. In a complex adaptive system, however, the system is made up of elements which are often referred to as agents. And these agents, the elements within the system, will learn, and I put learn in uh, quotation marks because there's a good deal of controversy around what does it mean to learn as opposed to adapt and change. But the elements learn and change their behavior given externalities, given the condition of the system, given, of it, given its interaction with uh, other elements. And so you'll have a differing response. The picture here is a batfish. And this is uh, an interesting fish because it lives around a coral reef. And in a stasis situation with the coral reef, if everything is okay and operating um, as it generally should operate, this batfish eats small invertebrates. But the coral reef as an ecosystem is a balance between an algae that lives on the reef and the coral itself. If conditions change and the algae become predominant over the coral, in other words, the reef starts to have large algae spots on it, um, then there are algae eating animals which will feast on the, on the algae and become more numerous and uh, thrive and they'll eat the algae back until the coral reef is, is back in stasis, the coral is rebalanced. But if the algae get to a point where um, these algae eaters are not containing it and it's taking over the reef and the reef is getting seriously out of stasis, this batfish will start to increase its numbers and will shift from eating small invertebrates to eating algae or perhaps add algae to its diet. But in any case, um, scientists observing coral reefs have found that the algae will start to disappear and the reef will start back towards stasis and the operating factor is the batfish who under normal reef conditions doesn't eat algae at all. The batfish adapts, the reef system adapts. It's a complex system, but it's a complex adaptive system in this sense. So we have um, dynamic complexity and detail complexity. We have physical complexity and adaptive complexity. So there are lots of different kinds of complex problems that we may encounter and we may be called upon to, to uh, deal with. Now, another thing that emerges, especially in these uh, complex systems, are what we call wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that are unclear in terms of their definition and boundaries it's hard to get a grasp on what is the real problem. Very often uh, the literature about wicked problems concerns social problems, uh, problems in, of stability in an economic situation. Wicked problems are also characterized by having no stopping rules. There's no clear point that you can get to that you know you have solved the problem and you can quit trying to exert uh, an influence over the, the system, over the problem. There's not a clear stopping rule. And they're also characterized, and this is how we most often see wicked problems in the systems engineering world, by incomplete, changing, 
and or contradictory requirements. Now I'm sure nobody's ever encountered customers who come back and, and change requirements or requirements that morph over time or contradictory requirements or incomplete requirements where we're left to uh, fill in the blanks. And actually, of course, we all see that and we see that pretty frequently. So how do we wrangle this kind of complexity? How do, how do we handle wicked problems and problems in complex adaptive systems or problems in complex physical systems? How can we get our minds around it and understand the problem first and understand the system that we're dealing with and come to some idea of how we're going to to uh, wrangle this issue? Well, the key involves returning to the definition of a system. A system is defined as a construct or collection of different elements that together produce results not possible for any of the elements acting alone. There are three aspects to this definition that we need to keep in mind that become very important. The first aspect here is that it's a construct or a collection. In other words, a system holds its elements in relationship to each other in a particular way. And that makes it a construct or collection. It's not just a random heap of elements, but it's a, a collection or a construct that are hooked together in relationship. It involves different elements. So there are different discrete elements that are held together in relationship by this construct or collection. If you have a single element, you don't have a system. You have to have different elements that you can see. And then finally, these elements held together in, in a construct or, or collection will interface or interact with each other and produce results that are not possible for any of the elements acting alone. Russell Acoff, the uh, systems thinker who was a professor at the Wharton School, says that um, a car is a system and taking us from home to the grocery store is a result that's not possible for just the tires. It's not possible for just the engine. It's not possible for just the tires and the engine. It requires the system of the car to produce those results, which of course are what gives the car its value. So these are our three elements uh, that we have to keep in mind as we deal with systems and deal with system problems. How do we keep those in mind? Well, we keep those in mind by taking a systems view. And by a systems view, we mean a view that shows us at the same time the construct, the elements arranged in the construct, and the results that are produced. It's very important that that's what it takes to make a systems view. So if you have one view that shows you the elements and another view that talks about the construct, then you don't have a systems view. If your views are fragmented apart, then you're not truly taking a systems view. And we're going to talk about how that becomes important. The systems view helps us to leverage our understanding about the task that faces systems engineers. So what is that task? What's our primary task? Well, our primary task is to take a set of requirements, and sometimes we have to do some work on the set of requirements in order to make them complete and understandable, but to take the requirements of our customers and stakeholders and, and deliver a system whose results 
will meet those requirements. So our system design has to meet those requirements. We can think of this like a puzzle. The requirements define the shape and size of the missing puzzle piece. And the missing puzzle piece are the results that are produced by the system that we design. So our task is to design a system, design a puzzle piece that fulfills the requirements or fits exactly into the missing, the hole that uh, is waiting for the missing piece. So the way that we do that is that we have to make a prediction as we design a system or modify an existing system. We have to make a prediction about what the results will be. And we're trying to guide the modifications to the system so that the results will fit into that, that uh, missing puzzle piece. So we have to look at the construct and we have to look at the elements. We have to see them in relationship. We have to understand how those relationships cause the elements to interact so that we can understand what results will be produced and we can understand what we need to do in order to modify those results. Because where we want to come out is we want to come out in the place where our results will fit into the hole defined by the requirements so that our results will satisfy the requirements. Now how do we go about defining what that systems view is going to be? How do we know what, what we need to do? Well, the first thing that we need to remember is that the systems view, like the systems definition, is always a boundary issue. So it depends upon what our commission is. What, it, what is the missing piece? What are we called in to supply? What are we designing? And that's defined by the boundary. So with an electrical system, we might be called in to design the missing piece, which is a hydro gener generation facility. Or we might be called in to define a, a missing piece, which is a transmission system. We have a hydro facility and we have consumers, and so we need to, to design a, a transmission system. Or we might be working at the consumer level to design a, a uh, receiving and distribution system that will get the, get the electricity right to the people who need to use it. But that definition is going to tell us where the systems view is. And inside that boundary, we'll find the elements and we'll find the construct and we'll produce the results that we have to produce. So first we need to look to the boundary conditions. The second thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we get a complete systems view. If there are elements we can't see, relationships that we don't understand, we're not going to be able to make an accurate prediction. So we can't have pieces of our systems view obscured or blurred because we need to develop a, a complete understanding. Now how does that happen? How do we get incomplete views? Well, sometimes it happens because we decide in the highest traditions of the Enlightenment that we're going to operate as specialists, that uh, we are going to operate in the different systems engineering domains. How many times have you heard someone say, I'm a requirements engineer, or I'm a system architect, or I do test and evaluation, or I do functional analysis. All of that's fine. And actually we need the understanding that's developed by people who, who devote their time to looking at one or another of these domains and develop that specialized knowledge. But none of those folks are systems engineers because the systems engineer has the broader commission 
is responsible for predicting and constructing the results to produce the puzzle piece that will fit into the, to the hole that's defined by the requirements. So all of those folks are valuable contributors. The, dis, the domain professionals are valuable contributors to your design process. They're just not systems engineers. Um, I like to tell folks who, who tell me about being one of those that while they're not systems engineers, they work for systems engineers. The other way that, that we uh, tend to divide up the world is that even though we accept the commission as systems engineers, we choose tools and methods that divide our systems view up into fragmented parts. So we have requirements over here, we have uh, behavior over there, we have physical architecture here, we have our verification and validation tools in a different place. And so what we have are a bunch of different smaller segmented views. Now, in order to truly do systems engineers, we have to aggregate those views. If we aggregate the information that's in those views, typically that's done in our heads. So we may be using a number of, of tools and methods, and we may have information in different bins scattered around, but the only way that we can see it is to aggregate it in our heads, and that's not very efficient. I know, especially as I get older, the, uh, the level of complexity that my mind can handle all at one time without any assistance seems to be decreasing. So uh, we have to be careful that we're taking a true systems view and not fragmenting our view of the system. And that's because if we don't have a systems view, then we can't make a prediction. We can't predict what results will be produced with any kind of certainty if we don't have a systems view. So when we look into our crystal ball, we need to see the systems view in order to be able to predict what the results will be and therefore decide that we're on the right track in our design to satisfy the requirements. So what we're after is a systems view that gives us a reasonable assurance that the piece that we're producing will fit. So this piece is, is fitting into the puzzle, but our assurance that that's happening as we go through the design process rests on having the systems view. Because after all, what we're trying to do is match results to requirements. Now there are other ways that the systems view helps us, that it, it increases the probability of our success. One of those is that taking a systems view broadens our capacity and increases the quality of our solution set. We're all familiar with the principle that um, there are mathematical formulas for how many ways you can relate a number of elements. So if these six marbles here are emblematic of the six elements of a system, then we could immediately figure out how many possible arrangements there are. That gets magnified for us as systems engineers because not only are there just arrangements of these elements, but there are different qualities and characteristics of the relationships that connect them. Adding elements, increasing the number of elements that are, that are possible will exponentially increase the ways in which they can be arranged. So if we only have six marbles to choose from in solving our problem, we're more limited than if we had more marbles. So if we have a wider variety of marbles and marbles with different characteristics, all of a sudden we have a much greater palette to work with. 
and for us, we're also increasing our ability to place things in relationship by increasing the number of ways in which they can relate. So by taking a systems view, we can begin to get a view of different sets of relationships. So we can arrange these elements into different relationships to each other and we can begin to define different behaviors as the result of the interactions within these relationships. So we can set our construct up in a number of different ways and it's really the relationships that are the key to the ways that the elements can interact and are therefore keys to the results that we can get out of our elements. Now, how does this become important? Well, one of the best uh, examples of the importance of this comes out of the 1952 Nobel Prize in Medicine. This is a very interesting situation. Uh, the look at the structure of DNA, or what actually was going to become called DNA, had been going on for some time. Um, Friedrich Miescher, for instance, in 1869 had discovered uh, the nucleon, which is the, the uh, very, very basic building block that goes into DNA. In 1919, uh, Phoebus Levine uh, posited the existence, and, and this was subsequently borne out in his research and others, of the polynucleotides that made it up. And as time went on, you know, almost a century's elapsed when Erwin Chargraff um, shows that these four basic nucleotides, the A and the T and the C and the G, operate in pairs and they always operate with A's paired with T's and C's paired with G's. Then there was work in x-ray crystallography going on with uh, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins um, using x-rays which were relatively new technologies at that point. And all of this was pointed at figuring out, how, we know that that these different elements are involved, but we don't know how they work because we don't know how they're related to each other. How are they structured? How are they held together? And it was Watson, James Watson, who was an American biologist, and Francis Crick, who was an English physicist, along with the work from Maurice Wilkins, that ultimately put together this double helix of the sugar phosphate backbones that held these base pairs um, in relation to each other as they were bound together with the hydrogen bonds. And it's really for the discovery of these relationships, of this structure, that the Nobel Prize in 19, 1962, rather, uh, was awarded in physiology and, or medicine. Um, to those three scientists. Their discovery was a critically important one because it made sense out of all of the work that had been done before. And it allowed us to really actually look at the operation of DNA from a structural standpoint. So where have we been? What have we said here? First, we talked about the challenge. And we talked about how the complicated becomes the complex, the difference between the complicated where the result is deterministic and linear to the complex where the results are emer the result of emergence from the relationship of the, the different elements of the complex system. We talked about the difference between dynamic complexity, the operation of the system over time, and detail complexity, lots of moving parts. We talked about the difference between physical, complex physical systems and adaptive or complex adaptive systems, where the physical systems change states, arrangements of the elements from one to the other according to the operation of a set of rules 
and adaptive um, systems operate with different elements or agents that are able to learn or adapt behavior based on the experience of the system. We talked about wicked problems with incomplete, changing or contradictory requirements and unclear problem definitions and boundaries with problems without stopping rules so that we don't know where they're finished. And we talked about all of this in the context of the challenge that it presents to systems engineers. So how do we deal with that? Well, a key to dealing with it is to take the systems view. And to understand the systems view, we return to the definition of a system. So a system has to see all of the major aspects of the definition of the system. It has to allow us to see the construct or collection. It has to allow us to see the elements that make up the system. And then it has to allow us to be able to derive the results and predict the results with some degree of accuracy. Why? Because in the better we can predict the results, the better fit we can get to the requirements that we've been given, requirements that govern our modification or construction of a system. And that's our primary task. So the better we're able to fulfill our primary task, then the better we deliver for our customers. This is the principal value of the systems view, but it's not the only value because the systems view also broadens our capacity. It gives us a view to greater possibilities as we see more elements, more relationships, and more possibilities for results that emerge from our designs. I hope this has been valuable um, and that perhaps you've enjoyed it. I'm certainly willing to dialogue on any of this with anybody who would like to do that. Um, and I would be open to entertaining questions at this point if there are such. All right. Thank you, Zane. Um, we do have a few questions. Thank you to all the participants that have asked questions so far. I uh, do encourage you to join the discussion now and submit your questions in the uh, control panel for the webinar. Um, Zane, our first question comes from Gary, and his question is as follows. In the definition of a system, when you use the word different, would multiple instances of a single type, like the several carbon atoms in the buckyball illustration, satisfy the meaning of different? or does the element need to be at least two different types? Um, actually, I'm not sure. My, I haven't really researched this, so I'm going to go off the cuff here, which is always dangerous. I have an intuition that the, I know that repeated examples of the same element are perfectly permissible within a system. I have not seen an example of a system made up of only the same element over and over again. So I'm not sure whether that meets the definition of different. Um, most often the definition is used to say you can't have just one element. You have to be able to subdivide. So that's a good question and I'd be happy to research that and get back to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Daniel. And uh, his question is, Core 9 creates a function for each component created. Can you talk to the relationships of functions to a system's view? Um, yes, the, uh, the functions um, really represent the behaviors that satisfy the requirements. So the purpose for having a component in a system is to perform a function that in whole or in part then satisfies a requirement. So when we talk about uh, predicting the results, what we're doing in solving the problem is kind of working into that backwards 
because we know the result that we want. That's defined by the requirements. So we look and we say, okay, that means that the following functions or behaviors are necessary to satisfy those requirements. So what implementation does that imply? And then designing the implementation structure, what people call the physical architecture back from that. So we, we want to be able to, in terms of the system view, walk that back and forth. Uh, we want to be able to walk that traceability from the component through the behavior back to the requirement, from the requirement to the behavior and out to the component. Okay, and, and Daniel did have a follow-up question there. Um, does the function help define the requirement or does the requirement define the function? The requirement should define the function. Um, we, we as the designers are, are being asked to deliver the functionality that satisfies the requirement. So the requirement generally will define the function. Now in in creating the system, we may come up some, with some questions about the requirements. So we find that we go back and, and say, do you mean this or do you mean that? Um, in that sense, information about the function may help us to be clearer about the requirement, but it's the requirements that drive it. Uh, we're designing to the requirements. All right, and uh, we do have one more question. Uh, attendees, if you have any other questions, go ahead and send them in. If not, this will be the final question. Uh, this question comes to us from Ronald. If wicked problems have the challenges listed, how can one create a model that has sufficient fidelity to be useful? It would seem that any choice of boundaries and behavior would be quickly overcome by changes in the wicked problem. Um, that's true to some extent. If you, if you really want a, a treatment of this, uh, the area where I've found the most interesting uh, reflections on it are in the area of um, sociological and economic problems. And you wind up creating models that are not definitive. Um, but have sufficient uh, fidelity to be helpful. So you're, you're shining a light around, but you're not uh, making a high fidelity picture, I guess would be the way that, that I would depict that. But yes, the more wicked the problem, um, the less susceptible to a definitive model. But that's not a reason not to attempt to model because in attempting to model, you gain some understanding uh, through to the solution. Russell Acoff writes uh, some interesting stuff on that in some of his works on social policy. All right, thank you, Zane. And I did get one more question from Gary, um, and it is, um, is it correct to take away from your presentation that systems view doesn't refer to a single illustration and instead refers more to a mindset? Um, a systems view refers actually to both. Uh, first comes the mindset. If we don't have the systems view mindset, uh, then we can't hope to get the picture but we should also strive to get the picture. We should also strive to get that, that single view. Now let's, let's not um, get tangled up, and, and this is a danger, to get tangled up in the use of the word view uh, as a particular diagram. So a systems view may mean more than one diagram, but a systems view uh, shouldn't mean more than one model. So as you model uh, the system, you need to be able to embody that mindset into the model. You may not be able to get it all in one snapshot. Uh, you may have to have different, quote, views. So in that sense, it's not a single diagram, but uh, it, it is uh, 
a single model. All right. Well, thank you, Zane. I think that wraps up questions. If anyone has any last-minute questions, go ahead and get them in. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up. I um, do want to thank you, Zane, for the presentation today. If you have uh, other questions or comments for Zane, don't hesitate to send him an email. His address is there on the screen. He'd be happy to hear from you with any inquiries that you may have. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Our next webinar will be scheduled in August. Uh, we are taking uh, July off for webinars as Vitech will be attending the INCOSI IS in Edinburgh. So if you are going to be there, please drop by our booth. Uh, remember at the conclusion of the webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. And it doesn't look like any other questions have come in, so that's all for today. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.